Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. <laughs> So, happy Daylight Savings Day. So everyone, take a moment and just stretch so you won't fall asleep. <laughs> All right. And uh, Rusty reminded me that it's Penny's birthday, so everyone bombard her with happy birthday. She'll enjoy that. So that'll be great. <coughs> One of the questions that I've been asked recently by a lot of you is, does God ever not listen to our prayers? You know, when we talked about this year of prayer, that was something where a lot of you actually came to me and asked that question. That was one of the most common questions I've been asked so far in this year of prayer was, is there anything that we can do that actually prevents God from listening to us? Or actually cause our prayers to be less effective? Because ultimately, we want our prayers to be effective. So if there's barriers to that, how do we get rid of them? And I thought about that and I prayed about it and I've been studying it and, and I got my answers a long time ago, but I've been studying a little bit more about that and the answer to that is yes. And that might be a hard truth. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of James that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. But in order for that statement to be true, then the opposite of that truth has to be true too, which means an unrighteous person's prayers are ineffective and not powerful. Otherwise, what would be the difference between a prayer and a powerful prayer, a righteous person and an unrighteous person? And so one of the things that I want us to do today and next week is I'm going to be answering your questions. Well, I've been asked, when are you going to talk about things that get in the way of prayers? And I kept telling people, wait till March. And so I wanted to talk about that. So this week and next week, we're going to talk about some things that get in the way of our prayer lives. And as Christians who want to have this deep relationship with God, this powerful prayer that when we ask of God, we can come to him with more confidence. And how do we do that? What are the things that get in the way? You know, one of the things that bothers people is that idea that maybe God doesn't always listen or have to listen. You know, I, I often ask people, as God, is he obligated to do anything for us in reality? Let me ask you this, because people will say, well, isn't God obligated to listen to my prayers? And then I would ask him the question, have you ever been called by a telemarketer? Now, if, you, if a telemarketer calls you, are you obligated to pick up your phone and listen through their whole spiel? How many of you have ever hung up on a telemarketer? Sinners. You know, you don't, you don't want an extra subscription to Aardvark Magazine? You know, one of the things that we have to do is realize God's not obligated. Everything that God does for us is actually a part of his grace, which actually makes prayer a more powerful and amazing thing because it says, I don't have to listen to you, but as God who loves you, I want to listen to you, and I choose to listen to you. Which makes prayer much more powerful because it's not something God's obligated to do, but it's something that God wants to do, which makes prayer so much deeper and more intimate. But as we know, prayer is part of that aspect of our relationship with God that really grows our intimacy with Him and our transformation to be like His Son, Jesus. And so one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is, is prayer powerful? And if I believe it's powerful, and if I'm not seeing it being powerful in my life, is there something blocking that? <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I was driving one day uh, in college, and in Washington State, there's a mountain range that divides the state between Western Washington and Eastern Washington. And there's this city no known as North Bend where a lot of people will stop because that's where you fill up, you eat something, whatever, as you're crossing the mountain pass. 
And so one day I was driving this mountain pass, and I stopped off at North Bend. I get gas, go grab a cup of coffee, and then I went and I tried to turn on my car, and it wasn't working. And if you know anything about me, me and cars have bad luck. I've always had car problems. It never ma mattered what car it was. And here I am, I'm not a very handy person by nature. I was very young, I didn't know what to do. And so I opened up my hood, looked around pretending like I knew what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. And obviously I must have had some kind of look on my face like I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And this gentleman walks over to me and he says, need help son? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and, and so he took a moment, had me kind of try to start the car. He listened for a few things, looked at a few things, and he just looked at me and said, will you buy me a Coke? And I was just like, okay, I'll go buy you a Coke. So I went in and to the store and bought him a Coke, and he takes this Coke, opens it up, takes it one sip of it, and then he pours it on my car battery. And I'm looking at him, and he says, start it up. And then I went and put the key in, and it started right up. And I was just like, what's in Coca-Cola? <laughs> I'm never drinking that stuff again. <laughs> but but what, was, what was happening was there was this white powdery stuff that built up on the battery. And he says, you know what? That was preventing your car from having the power it needed. So when you go home, tell your dad you need to tune up. Tell him to check the connectors, check the battery. And I thought, you know what, all it took was this little white powder stuff to prevent my car from having the power it needed to run. And that's kind of the same thing in regards to our prayer life sometimes. Is that we have this great power at our disposal. We have God who says, ask of me. You know my character, ask of me. And you, I'm all powerful. So if you're going to pray to someone, pray to the one who has all power. Don't trust in yourself. Pray to me. But then sometimes in our life, we kind of let that white powder build up in our lives. So we're, our connection with God is a little bit off. And so we don't get to access some of his power. Now, in regards to prayer, sometimes we have barriers in our life. And oftentimes when we talk about our prayer lives and we ask the question, why do sometimes my prayers don't seem so effective? How come it doesn't seem like sometimes God's uh, actually answering them? But one of the things that I learned was it's not so much about whether it's about God. My first question is, if my prayers aren't being answered, what about me? I'm going to ask Dejan to come up here for a moment. Don't be afraid. Be, actually, be very afraid. <laughs> this is Dejan. Everyone say, hey, Dejan. Hey, Dejan. Now you're the most popular kid in church. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, if this is kind of what I want to describe for a moment with our, our prayer lives. If Dejan and, Dejan and I were right here, and I shut off my microphone, can I, he and I have a pretty good conversation. I'm going to turn this off for a second. Now, can anyone hear any of that? No. No, but I could, right? Now, I could hear what he was, what he was telling me. And because we were close. Even in his whisper, I could hear what he was saying. Now, I want you to go to the other side of that stage real quick. Faster. There you go. Now, if, if Dejan spoke in that same soft voice as he was just right here, would I be able to hear? No. No. Now, Dejan, run back over here. <laughs> Vamanos. Okay. Now, I want, I want us to do uh, an exercise. Every time I take a step, I want you to take two steps, okay? okay. Ready? Yeah. I'm taking a step. Now I'm going to take another step. Now I'm taking one more step. I'm going to take another step. And now I'm going to take another step. And again. Now I want us to see right there. This is kind of an illustration. Sometimes people ask the question, well, if God is pursuing me, how come my prayers are still not being answered? 
And part of that is, even though God is pursuing us, sometimes as he's trying to pursue us, sometimes we're like Dajon, and we're walking twice as fast away from him. And because he's doing that, God is trying to get a hold of us and try to talk to us, but we're going twice the speed to get away from him. That's a barrier. So even if God's trying to get your attention and talk with you, and he's walking twice as fast as I am, what's the communication going to be like in that situation? You see, the best kind of connection was when Deja and I were right here. He didn't have to talk loudly. He could just be right here because he, we are close. And so one of the main things that we want to talk about today is we want to get rid of some of the barriers because we want to be close with God. Not running away from him, not being distant from him, because in both circumstances, you could obviously see with your eyes that says, well, he's all the way over there, or he's walking twice as fast. Communication is not going to be as good. But when we're right next to each other, he doesn't have to talk even very loudly. And that's what we want to do in our prayer lives. We want to be so close to God and get rid of these barriers that we don't have to yell at God. Even in the small voice of prayer, God would respond. All right, thank you, Dejan. You can go ahead and sit down. Everyone give him a hand up and clap. All right. He told me a joke. I told him when I turned off the mic to tell me a joke. Very funny. He'll tell you that afterwards. So today what we're going to do is we're going to go over five different um, barriers to our prayer life. And next week we're going to go over five more so that way we can get rid of that. You know, get rid of the white film in our, our prayer lives so that we can have access to God. You know, we're going to put some Coca-Cola on our prayers. And so one of the things that I want us to do is I want us to look at some, five major barriers because you kept asking, are there things that get in the way of your prayer life with God? Is, is there anything that causes you to maybe run away from God or make it so that he doesn't hear? So the first one that I want to go over is prayer killer number one is unconfessed sin. Look at what, what uh, Psalm 66, 18 says. It says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You know, how many people feel like they want to pray a lot when they're sinning a lot? You know? Isn't that oftentimes when your prayer life seems to go down? It's when you, you dive into one sin, and then you do a little bit more, and then you do a little bit more, and it keeps on going on where you can go weeks without really a good quality prayer. You may say, thank you, God, for this meal, and thank you, God, help me not to get sick. But when it came to just like passionate, in-depth conversation with God, just worship to God, you know, sin gets in the way. We know from Isaiah 59 that sin separates us from God, but it doesn't just spiritually separate us, but it can be a barrier. It's kind of like, for instance, think about a time in your life where you had a close friend in your life, and they may have said something or done something, and you approached them about it, and they said, man, I didn't do anything wrong. It's all on you. And you're like, what? How is that possibly my fault? But, and they would not admit what they did wrong. And until they admitted what they did wrong, there really wasn't a very good quality relationship. And sometimes we do this with God. Sometimes we are so proud and selfish sometimes in our spiritual lives that sometimes we don't even deny God that there's even a problem. God, I'm not really having a problem. How come you're not blessing me more? I mean, I'm me. Why aren't you blessing me? But one of the things that we always need to evaluate is, How's our spiritual life? And is there sin in it? You know, the Apostle John wrote this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. It says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. Imagine this for a moment. Imagine standing before God and saying, how many of you would ever have the guts to do this? Stand before God and say, God, you're a liar. Do you know we do that a lot? When we're unwilling to confess our sins before God, we know if we're, he's faithful. So if we'll confess it, he'll wash it. 
You know, he'll get rid of that one barrier in our life that, so that we can stand in the throne room and talk with him. But then sometimes we'll go to God and say, God, I'm not the problem. It's not me. I didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, you're a liar. Now, when was the last time someone came up to you and said, you're a liar? And then you gave him a hug and you're like, hey, let's go out for coffee. Let's go talk. You know, do you see how insulting that would be? You wouldn't do that. So think about this holy, mighty, majestic God and think, should we ever think that maybe we should stop calling God a liar, maybe confess our sins to him? You know, one of the hardest parts as a minister, as a counselor, is trying to help people realize that there's a problem in the first place. That's why if you ever go to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's why they have you say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic. They want you to confess what you're struggling with and what your problem is. Because until you do that, you won't change. And that's one of the hard parts. That's why interventions happen. Like if a problem happens in your family and you've got this one person, you get the whole family to surround that person and say, hey, there's a problem here. We're saying this because we love you. We care about you. We know the direction you're going off. And if you keep doing that, something bad is going to happen. And so often the person will be like, I don't have a problem. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. It's your fault. You don't, you don't love me enough. You didn't pay for my life. You know? But you know sometimes how ridiculous it is. But then when someone has a humility and it says, okay, I, I did wrong. I'm sorry. And I want to change. That's when things begin to change. And that's what, why God can transform us in prayer when we say, God, I realize that prayer is transformational because when I'm willing to say, God, I'm sorry for my sin and I authentically mean it and I want to be different, please forgive me. God says, I'm faithful and just. I'll forgive you. And I'll help you along the way. And so you can tell God, God, I'm willing to confess it. And unless you have that purge that sin out of your life, unless you want to say, I'm done cherishing sin, then we can't get mad at God when we call him a liar and say, then why aren't you listening to me, liar? How come you're not blessing me, liar? Do you see how ridiculous that sounds? But when we confess our sins, then we say, God, I was a liar and I'm sorry. It builds our relationship with God. And it allows God to step in and say, let me forgive you, and let me help you be righteous. One of the second things that is a prayer carrier is a lack of faith. Let's look at what Mark 6, 5 through 6. And this is a scenario where Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth, and you think, you know what, if faith is going to be big, maybe it will be here. They know how good he was, you know. But look at how, what Jesus says here in regards to trying to have power in his hometown. It says in Mark 6, He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. You know, we didn't know that God is powerful. We know God wants to use his power to bless us. But sometimes we prevent God from being powerful in our lives just because we don't believe. One of the things is, if you actually believed prayer was powerful, how come we're not praying more? If you honestly believe prayer is powerful, why would we not pray more? And then when you pray, how come we sometimes doubt? Remember what James chapter 1 says, if you're asking God for wisdom, but then you don't actually believe he'll give you that, you're like t tossing and turning. Why would God bless you if you say, Okay, God, I'm going to ask you for something, but I really don't believe you're going to give it to me. Or the, or the pseudo-religious, if it be your will, meaning if we actually said that, that would be good. But if we say it, if it be your will, because I don't actually believe you're going to do it, so when it doesn't happen, I give you a way out, that's not really right. And so one of the things that we have to do is we need to have faith. If you want God to be powerful in your life, you've got to have faith. Faith ple pleases God. And think about this. Matthew 21, 22, Jesus says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, we have already talked about what that really means. When we align our hearts and our minds in accordance with God's heart and mind and word, and we're living that, we're going to have the same priorities and thoughts. So when we ask of him, we know it's going to be that. But one of the things is, are you asking 
and knowing that you're going to receive because you have faith. I mean, I have, think about all the religious people in the Bible. Do you know what really amazes me? In the book of James, it says that Elijah was a man just like us, and then it talks about the power of his prayer life. And if you ever look at the prayer life of Elijah, it was so powerful. He prayed to God, and he knew God would send fire down. It's like, did, did he have doubt? He knew he was going to win. He was mocking the other side. Maybe your God's not listening to you. But he believed. And then when he started praying for rain, guess what? The first time he prayed for rain, it didn't come. He sent a servant to go look for clouds. It, they went there, so the servant comes back. And so what does he do again? He doesn't say, well, I prayed once. God didn't respond. No, he had faith. And he said, okay, I'm going to pray again. Then he sent out a servant. And eventually, we see that rain came. And why? Because Elijah had faith. You know, one of the things that I've tried to do in my prayer life a little bit more is I'm trying to be one that prays with the belief that God has already answered it. You know, when I hear someone ask for a prayer, I pray, and then I expect that to be answered. And I'm surprised if it's not answered in the way that I pray for. I think I'm growing in that regard. And, and if something's not answered in the way that I prayed, there's one thing, there's a few things I do. One, do I have these barriers that we're covering in the next two weeks in my life right now? It's not really fo fo focus on God first. And second, is there a bigger picture that God has in mind that he's allowing my prayer not to be answered how I want? Is there something bigger in mind? Because that's why God would allow things to not be answered in my way if I always ask for his will to be done. So are you asking with confidence? When you pray to God, do you expect God to actually answer? I think we'd be surprised at how many more prayers would be answered if we had faith. The third prayer killer is disobedience. Look at what 1 John says here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 through 22. It says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his command and do what pleases him. I want you to think of that, about that for a moment. Why can we approach God with confidence? And part of the reason for that is because we know we can ask of him if we're obeying him and if we're trying to please him. I mean, imagine most of you have been parents in your life. When your kid's being a little brat and they say, Mommy, 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 I want candy. You're like, no. Forget it. I want to go to Mommy, I want to go to my little Bobby's house. And you're like, no, forget it. But if they're obedient and responsible and they're the kind of kid that wants to please you, you'd be like, yeah, I don't care. Stay there longer, you know? You, you would give in. You know, one of the problems is that we expect God to answer and bless us when we're disobeying him, which is one of the worst things that God could possibly do in order to try to spiritually mature and grow us. If God blesses us in the realm of disobedience, then it's pretty much saying, God, I don't love you, but I want the things from you. I want to love sin, but I just want you to continually bless me. That's ridiculous. And that's one of the things we've seen time and time again throughout the Bible. When people are obedient in faith, obey the word of God, God is more apt to listen and respond. And in fact, he wants to. You know, I told, I've been teaching my kids, there's a difference between spoiling and rewarding. You know, spoiling means, you know what, good or bad, you're trying to get things, and that's not good for you. But as a parent, we love to reward. So when you do what is right, not just not do bad things, but in order to do what is right, then we're eager to bless. We're eager to do what you want. We're more apt to do that. And so one of the things we have to understand is, are we being obedient to the Word of God? Because if we're not obeying the Word of God, how can we possibly expect God as a good Heavenly Father to bless us. And so then fourth, lack of transparency. Look at this one right here. 
In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now, th today is Sunday. This is the day where you behave the best. As a minister, I know that. Uh, right? You come into church smiling. Oh, I'm holy today. <laughs> Tomorrow. Oh, it's Monday. You know? But I want us to be transparent. Part of the why he says right here is we're to confess our sins. When was the last time you confessed your sins to a brother or sister in Christ? Because here's the powerful thing. Confession and transparency is a powerful thing because as a minister, I know that if you hold things in and you're trying to carry a burden all by yourself, it's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy you emotionally. It's going to destroy you psychologically. It's going to destroy you physically. You are not strong enough to handle things by yourself. That's one, why God is present and we need God. And two, why God created human beings to be communal beings. Because we cannot handle life by ourselves, no matter how strong you think you are. So one of the reasons why there's a barrier is because we sometimes have this pride that says, I want to look good. I want to be loved. I want to be respected. I want all these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend I'm amazing and I'm going to carry this burden on me that's consuming my life. I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm burdened. I'm bitter. I'm hurting. And I'm just going to hold it all in. But guess what? The Bible says, you get healing when you confess to each other. Why? One, doesn't it feel better when you can finally tell someone something and instead of any kind of anger or judgment, they say, you know what? I understand. And I'll pray for you. I'll love for you. And then you go, and you feel so much better. But then you also have not just you praying, but you have someone else praying for you. And then another person praying for you. So instead of just one prayer being lifted up to God with your name, you have two people or three people praying for you. You know, one of my long-term goals as a Christian is to be as humble as I can possibly be. The more I study the Bible, humility is one of the most powerful things. And it's really where I want to be because God is glorified in humility because it takes the focus off us onto God and he gets all the worship and praise he deserves. But one of the things that I learn about pride is there's various forms of pride and one of the forms of pride is there's outright, outright pride. You know that you look at a person you're like, that person's a very prideful person. They don't even deny it. But then there's also some subtle prides that we have. Once where we try to look very spiritual and religious and good, and we may even have well-intentioned pride. I mean, but it's still pride. You know, one of the things that I kind of dealt with earlier in this year was I was having some health issues. I was developing like an ulcer and all the different kind of uh, uh, physical signs of it. You could say I'm not going to be graphic or anything, but you could tell. Um, and it was a point where I was kind of having some subtle pride in my life because I, I, I'm that type that tries to do everything, try to carry, every, carry everyone's burdens, try to be there for everyone, try to work as hard as I can. I'm very zealous for the Lord, all those things. And I would kept on trying to disguise it as that, but then, you know, it was consuming me, and I didn't even realize it at the time. I mean, Destiny would tell me occasionally, but I wasn't necessarily listening. Sorry, wife. Uh, but, uh, but I was going, and then it, it hit me, and it was just like, you know what? If I believe God can do all things, and he's the one who's glorified, I need to step back and let God work. And because if I work and do all the stuff, then, then it lets God ha be involved less, and it allows him to be glorified less. And so I was kind of having this problem. And in fact, one day, I was, I was at Kroger, and I was like, you know, it, you, they tell you to eat things like rhubarb and aloe vera gel and things like that when you're developing that. And so I was having a bad attitude. I went to Kroger one day. I, I went to like three different stores looking for rhubarb, and no one had it. And so I finally found some frozen at Kroger. And it was all like clumped together as I was grabbing these bags of rhubarb, and I was just like throwing them into the um, grocery cart, because I was a little bit angry, and I was like, 
Well, they all clumped together, and I need to eat this right away. So I was just doing this. Next thing I know, Kathy Simpson's walking behind me. It's like, hey, you're damaging the merchandise? And I'm like, eh, whatever. I'm like, and she's like, what's the matter? And I'm like, uh, I'm having an ulcer. And I didn't even mean to tell her that, you know? I was having kind of like a little bit of a problem with that. And it was funny because that same day, I was texting Cheryl Kistler, and I was asking her, how are you doing? Are the things going all right? And, and she was telling me, oh, I'm doing okay. And one of the great things about Cheryl, she keeps on sending me all these wonderful Bible verses and stories and things and having a really upbeat attitude. But then she asked, how are you doing? And I was just like, not good. <laughs> and I kind of admitted to her, I didn't tell really anyone what my health problem was. But for some reason, I slipped it up and told her, and I was just like, you know, I'm having some health issues. She's like, Mike and I are going to pray for you. And, and so I was having pain all, like, the beginning of this year. I was grabbing my side. I was having all these problems. And, and then Winterfest was kind of, and we were going to go to the tents, and I was like, ugh, I'm going to feel absolutely miserable. But she, kept, she sent me a message saying, I'm going to pray for you. And shortly before Winterfest, Cheryl Kistler sent me a card in the mail that says, Mike and I have been praying for you. And it's, I'm not even kidding. After I got that card, like, the pain of my ulcer kind of went away. I'm not even kidding. And I was just like, huh, that's cool. <laughs> I was like, I shouldn't be surprised. And then some of the health issues related to that, like, went away. And I was just like, Maybe I should have confessed some of my subtle pride earlier so I wouldn't have dealt with some of my pain. And I thought, you know what? I had people like Mike and Cheryl and so forth praying for me. And so, you know, sometimes confessing, even saying, you know, God, I even have this subtle pride in my life. I, I'm being well-intentioned. I'm not doing it because I want to be prideful. But God, I need you to work. And guess what? You know, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If we confess to one another, we can pray for each other. You know, I often tell people, I can't pray specifically for you if I don't know what's going on in your life. And you can't pray for what's in my life if I don't tell that to you either. Does that make sense? And I think that's one of the reasons why God wants us to pray for one another because it's powerful and effective. It brings healing because we know I can let someone else help carry my burden, my brother, sister, in Christ. And now I have multiple people praying to God on my behalf. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? So we need to realize we need to have some transparency. And then the last one is unforgiveness. Not forgiving. You know, look at what Jesus says here. And this was when Jesus was teaching the Lord's Prayer on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will will not forgive your sins. Jesus can't get any more blunt than that. If you ever read the Gospels, Jesus is one of the most blunt preachers ever. That's one of the things I love about Jesus. I'm like, just tell me the truth. Jesus is like, okay, you don't forgive people, I'm not going to forgive you. A little too blunt, you know? But one of the things is, are we doing that? You know, one of the barriers to our prayer life is a lack of forgiveness. Think about the story in the parable of the unmerciful servant. Do you guys remember that story? Where this unmerciful servant, this mer servant owes the king lots and lots of money, and he says, I'll pay you back, blah, 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 blah. He was never going to be able to make enough money to pay the king back. But the king was gracious and said, I'll forgive you. And so this unmerciful servant goes, and he sees another fellow servant who owes him very little money and versus how much the original servant owed the king. And he grabs the other servant, and he starts choking it, and he says, pay me what you owe me. And the guy, servant, other servant, falls to his knees and says, oh, be patient with me. I'll pay you back. And the, the servant who originally got forgiven by the king was like, nope, you're going to jail, buddy. And he has him thrown into jail. The other servants hear about it. They go to the king and tell the king what the servant did. And the king gets mad, calls that original servant back and says, okay, I forgave you. You can forgive that guy. Okay, you're going to jail. Pretty strong message. You know, and then the worst part about that story was the servant was cast out of the king's presence forever. You see, that's why a lack of forgiveness is so dangerous 
One, because you won't be forgiven. It says that in the Bible very clearly. But two, that's the point where, you know, your prayer life is going to be harder because he's casting you out of his presence. If I, give, if I am willing to forgive you to the point of letting my son die the worst death, but you can't forgive this person who did very little to you in comparison, then you must not appreciate grace. You don't understand what I did for you. And so when you think about that, all the sins that we may do, and here's the thing, sometimes we're going to hurt each other's feelings. We're family. Sometimes we're going to offend each other intentionally or unintentionally. But this is where the love of Christ invades our hearts and just says, you know what? I'm going to be Jesus. And I'm going to forgive you. Whether or not you ask for it, I'll forgive you. And, I, and remember, I asked you at the beginning of my sermon, when, when we get up and we hug each other, see Christ and remember that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in each one of these believers. And because of that, shouldn't I forgive because of that? You know, the book of Hebrews tells us that the root of bitterness corrupts many. That's why being angry, unforgiving, resentful, hurtful, is a dangerous thing because it really, the book of Hebrews is telling us, you know what? That's not only going to corrupt you, it's going to corrupt everybody else. That's why forgiveness is so powerful because it heals you and heals everyone around you too. Think about relationships. Relationships always are better when forgiveness exists. Think about marriage. What, happen, what would happen to marriages if there was no forgiveness? What would happen to the parent-child relationship if there was no forgiveness? What would happen in our relationships as a church? What would happen if there was no forgiveness? There would be division. There would be a lack of glory of God. There would be animosity and anger. The fruits of the Spirit out the window. But this is where we say, you know, I'm willing to forgive you. I love you too much not to forgive you. Do you ever say that about your brother and sister in Christ? I love you too much so much so that the only response is, I have to forgive you. And guess what? Not only do you bless that other person, but you allow God to heal and say, you know what? I'm going to take the bitterness out of your life. I'm going to take the hurt out of your life. And if that person does need a good disciplining or vengeance, I'll take care of it. You see, that's the amazing thing about forgiveness. Is that forgiveness always draws people closer together. But when there's a lack of forgiveness, it tears apart. And that's why forgiveness is so important because God not only cares about your relationship with Him, but He cares about our relationship to one another. And when we are willing to forgive one another and love one another, we draw closer to God because we're doing the very act that Jesus Christ did when He came to seek and save the lost. And that was to forgive. Forgiveness draws us closer to God and it allows prayer to be so powerful. So today we covered the first five barriers that I'm going to be talking about. We talked about unconfessed sin. If you have sin in your life, I'm asking you not to be prideful or selfish, but spend some time alone with God today and confess to Him. He already knows. Allow Him to forgive you and overcome it. We talked about a lack of faith. We need to start changing our mentality and just expect God's going to answer our prayer. And if He doesn't, then maybe God has something bigger in plan for His will. But let's just assume God's going to answer. We also need to realize we need to be forgiving. Are we forgiving each other? Are we having a transparency with one another, allowing each other to confess? And are we obeying the word of God? Saying, God, I want to please you. And I'll obey you. And I demonstrate and manifest my love for you through obedience of the word of God. Do you see how getting rid of these barriers and doing what God has called us to do will draw us closer to Him? It's like me and Deshaun. When we were right next to each other, he didn't have to talk loudly. He could talk very softly. And I would hear him. But just like in the example of Deshaun, if he was on the other side, or if he walked twice as fast away from me even though I pursued him, if that happened, there was the prayer communication would not be as effective. So church, I ask you to make a point in your life to get rid of these barriers 
so that we can be the praying church God has called us to be. And when we do, we get rid of that white dust out of our prayer lives and the connection to God's power is greater. So let's get rid of these barriers. Let's build our relationship with God and let's worship and praise Him and be close to Him in prayer. In a moment, we're going to sing our song of invitation. If you're dealing with some sin or if you're dealing with a struggle or if you need someone to pray for you, in the back, our elders have made the decision. They want to be back there ready to pray with you. They could take you to a different room or whatever and they can do that. If today you also want to say, I want to study God's Word and learn about giving my life to Christ so that He can save me, I'll be in the back as well. And if you, after service, you grab me, and we'll Bible study with you, we'll help you grow. We'll help you be saved in Christ. And if today you also want to give your life to Christ in faith and baptism, we give you that invitation as well as we now stand and sing. Sinners, Jesus will receive.